One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, good. All right. All right. I have a tw I have a, a ten o'clock sharp. So let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to uh, the Science Circles uh, continuing series of panel discussions on science uh, science topics. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that uh, the Science Circle uh, is a grant funded uh, nonprofit. So, um, and these, uh, uh, these presentations are videotaped and uploaded to YouTube. So I will please ask you to be on your best behavior. Um, uh, today, we're going to be looking at uh, recent, uh, or, uh, recent advances in uh, nucleic acid sciences, that's RNA and DNA, um, uh, which has seen in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, really sort of jaw-dropping um, uh, displays of the power that we hold in our hand uh, with uh, this uh, technology. Um, and to really dive into this with us today, I, we have with us Marianne uh, Clark, uh, Max Chatnoir, who teaches biology at Texas Wesleyan University, and Stephen Gazier, who is currently a scientist at Corteva AgriSciences uh, and does education and research in molecular biology. Uh, so if you will direct your attention up front to the slide here, I have a very simplistic cartoon of uh, DNA. Uh, and I'm going to be using my little printer here. If you look by the word guanine there, you can see the little red dot. So that's my laser pointer. So hopefully you all can see that. So um, what you have with DNA is a, um, a, a double helix, right? Um, the the um, frame of the helix is this phosphate in yellow, right? Two sets of it, right? So, um, and then the steps of the helix are the nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, right? So these steps um, are kind of like Tetris pieces, I think is kind of an, uh, maybe a good analogy for how they fit together. So that thymine always matches with adenine and likewise for cytosine and guanine. So, um, and they fit together like little Tetris pieces. So, um, and uh, uh, DNA, uh, and I should, uh, I want to, uh, RNA and DNA are virtually the same molecule. The only difference really is whether there's oxygen or not. I mean, so um, RNA is ribonucleic acid and DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, right? So it's lost its oxygens, but otherwise they're, pretty much identical. Um, so uh, DNA is thermolabile, which means that it melts. Um, part of this backbone contains sugars and sugars melt. So um, uh, you can denature this protein molecule into single strands. And this is how um, DNA is sequenced. You, you denature it into a single strand and, um, uh, and then um, using uh, typically gel electrophoresis, for example, you chew it up and then run it through a, a, GNA, uh, uh, through a gel, uh, which creates bands. And by reading the bands, you can determine the sequence of the nucleotides. And this is an, a photograph here of what a bank of DNA sequencers looks like, right? So it's really um, scaled up, sort of an industrial scale. Um, and um, uh, so here is a little cartoon of messenger RNA, right? So DNA is in the nucleus of the cell, this uh, purple region here, right? And um, it gets read in a process called transcription in which a, a segment of this double helix is unzipped, so to speak, and read by spe specialized proteins, which then generate an RNA molecule. 
which is a, a, a mirror image of the portion of the DNA that's been read, um, or not even a mirror image, a copy, actually. And this uh, mRNA, what it's doing is um, its nucleotide sequence codes for a protein, right? So then, uh, but the nucleus does not have any machinery to make a protein. So the mRNA um, migrates out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it attaches right here to this molecule, which reads, which then is kind of like, just like, uh, like reading, uh, almost like a, a cassette machine, uh, reading, a, uh, reading a song off of a cassette tape. And uh, it reads the sequence and then generates it. It assembles amino acids out of the cytosol of the plant of the of the cell. This is the cytosol here, which is full of amino acids, and it assembles them uh, into a string of proteins here. So that's what mRNA is. It's messenger RNA. It's it's a messenger from the DNA, right, uh, to get read here and create into a protein. So what the um, so by utilizing this technology, uh, we were able to create a vaccine, or rather, by using this biology, we were able to create a vaccine for COVID nineteen, literally within weeks of the DNA sequence of COVID-19 being uh, developed. Um, um, and this uh, is a really transformative way. So what we've done is that with the way the vaccine works is that it, uh, the MR, it's an mRNA vaccine. So the mRNA codes for the COVID-19 spike protein. And the spike protein is the protein that attaches to the cell and injects the COVID-19 DNA uh, uh, or nucleic acids into the cell. And, um, uh, uh, and then uh, generates uh, copies of the, of the virus. So um, by injecting the mRNA into your body, um, uh, it will uh, attach to the transcribing uh, molecule here, the, uh, the enzyme here, and um, will just generate lots of copies of the uh, COVID-19 spike protein, which then gets released into your, into your system and triggers an antibody response. And then that antibody response in turn triggers a cellular response and basically just turbocharges the immune system against the COVID-19 virus. Now, this is a fantastic uh, advance over traditional virus uh, vaccines, which, use, which typically used um, um, uh, uh, inactivated uh, viruses to generate the immune response. And this new method of messenger RNA vaccines is so much more elegant. The vaccine itself has many fewer ingredients than a traditional vaccine does. It's much easier and less expensive to produce. You know, we've been able to generate millions of doses of the mRNA vaccine in a matter of months, which is unbelievable. And, um, um, uh, and in fact, and so here's a, here's a slide showing how we have scaled up. This is the machinery involved in scaling up production of the um, COVID-19 vaccine, right? So um, uh, just again, to show you sort of how, what it looks like at an industrial scale to do this stuff. Um, and uh, the, the mRNA vaccine is such a breakthrough that Merck, recently announced that um, it has abandoned its efforts to develop a traditional um, uh, incapacitated virus vaccine um, because it's just an acknowledgement that we have entered into a whole new world of, of vaccine production uh, through the development of mRNA vaccines. Now, um, uh, another uh, big breakthrough um, in DNA technology was the um, 
ability to sequence DNA. And the ability to sequence DNA is fa fantastically uh, enhanced by the invention of polymerase chain reaction, PCR. So PCR is um, a method to, um, uh, to create many, many, many copies of a, uh, uh, of a strand of DNA. Um, and the way it works, uh, and I also wanted to point out that PCR is also extremely important in forensic applications of DNA technology, because often at a crime scene, um, the amount of DNA left by a perpetrator may be minute, um, and it's not really, there's really not enough there to develop a DNA profile of the perp, um, but this can be overcome by amplifying the amount of DNA by making many, many copies of it through the use of PCR. Now, this slide I have up here um, is actually uh, a little in inapplicable. This is actually about reverse transcriptase, but just ignore that because it's still, it was still the best sort of cartoon slide I found uh, that uh, kind of s sort of helped explain the process, which is that you, so if you'll follow my pointer up here at the top, um, you have denatured the DNA into, um, uh, uh, into single strands, right? Then and you do that because the DNA is thermolabile, you melt it and, uh, and then develop it into single strands. Um, you can then add a primer here in green at one end. Um, and then there is a molecule here, which um, a polymerase molecule in blue here, um, which then uh, reconstitutes the uh, original strand. So here you see yellow, red, blue here. These are all um, the nucleotides that are, that are pairing up with their counterparts here, right, and reconstituting it. So and here you see the polymerase molecule here walking along uh, the single strand, reassembling the DNA, right? And so here from the, at the second to the bottom, here you have a reconstituted DNA, and then um, uh, then you can do the whole thing over again. You then take this reconstituted DNA and melt it to denature it into single strands here at the top, and you do the whole process over again. This is called thermocycling, um, and um, uh, so by doing this many thousands of times. Um, you can uh, generate uh, big amounts of DNA, which you can then use to create a genetic, genetic profile of a perp, for example. All right. So, um, 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 I did also want to point out uh, with respect to uh, the forensic uses. So, um, uh, uh, um, in addition to PCR, so, uh, well, I should say that, uh, so in a forensic instance, uh, it's quite possible that a perp, besides leaving DNA, might have left hair behind. Uh, in the past, um, you could not generate a DNA profile from hair unless the hair had a root, um, uh, because the root has, you know, actual cells uh, that um, you can extract DNA from to create a profile. And that was always a big problem because hair rarely falls out by the root. It's often just sort of broken off and you just have a, a hair strand without a root. But recently, just in like 2019, a big breakthrough was made um, which uh, came out of techniques in paleontology, which were used to an analyze Neanderthal DNA. Um, and this technique is able to be applied to rootless hair to create a DNA profile from rootless hair. Um, and this is a brand new breakthrough, um, which, uh, uh, which uh, holds great promise for forensic applications. Um, then... Uh, of course, another aspect of, uh, of DNA science is to be able to identify specific individuals from their DNA. And I'm not going to get into too much details about that because um, Stephen is going to uh, give a little presentation in a few moments here about 
how DNA is used to identify individuals. I would just briefly mention that um, it is generally done through the identification of short tandem repeats, what are called STRs. These are um, uh, clusters of repeated segments of, uh, of uh, uh, DNA sequences. And then that has been further enhanced uh, through the discovery of single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, SNPs, um, which can um, identify an individual even more precisely. Um, just as an example, um, through a short tandem repeat, you can identify an individual, say, to, to within one in a million, but using single nucleotide polymorphisms, you can identify an individual to within one in a trillion. You can identify an individual so precisely that the odds of the DNA belonging to someone else is more than all the people that have ever existed uh, in the history of the earth. So very, very precise identification methods. Um, then another big breakthrough is DNA phenotyping, which is, I have an example up here on the slide. Um, DNA phenotyping um, has become possible through the identification of suites of genes that control facial appearance, um, width, height, lips, eyes up here. So you can see uh, kind of the images that are created. And through DNA phenotyping, from DNA alone, in the bottom half of the slide, you can generate a composite image of what an individual might look like. And here at the far right, you can see what the individual actually looks like. So this is an unbelievable breakthrough in my mind. And not only that, you can age progress the composite so that what he would have looked like in his 20s, what he would have looked like in his 40s, what he might look like in his 60s. Here is an example of a DNA a phenotype on the left generated through DNA phenotyping. And on the right is an arrest photo of the actual perp. Um, and this is sort of interesting, the hair color, the skin tone, um, the, uh, the, the width of the face, the eye placement, the lips, it's remarkable. It's in my mind, these DNA phenotypes are often better than composite drawings um, developed by eyewitnesses to a crime. It's amazing. But doesn't always work. So here is a slide of uh, what I consider kind of a failure of the DNA phenotyping, especially the one on the right, um, where the DNA phenotype, I think, is, the skin tone doesn't seem quite right. The actual perp uh, looks like um, uh, is uh, much more light skinned than the D DNA phenotype uh, generated. Although the eyebrows, the hair, the chin, they're all pretty close. So, you know, um, yeah, could be from sun exposure. There could be a, vi a variety of things that could alter the skin shade. Um, the main thing to keep in mind with the DNA phenotyping is that it's not so much uh, that it comes up with uh, what the person looks like. What it does do is allow p uh, police to eliminate suspects, right? There's a famous... Um, or there's an episode in Forensic Files where the police were searching for a serial killer um, who, would, uh, um, uh, who would go up to houses and knock on the door. And um, when a woman would answer, he would ask to use their phone, saying that his car had broken down or something and he wanted to use their phone. He would get into the house and then he would strangle them with a telephone cord. And there he did this five or six times. And they were searching for a white perp because eyewitnesses said he was white and also because serial killers tend to be white. Um, but through DNA phenotyping, they realized that, in fact, the perp was probably of Afri African, African descent. Um, and uh, this completely redirected the, um, the direction of the investigation. Um, so um, that's just an illustration of how DNA phenotyping simply helps you eliminate um, uh, 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 
uh, prospects uh, or suspects and um uh and 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 not waste um uh, police resources oops hang on here i got that i got my instructions wrong here so um and I also want to mention that um, later on, uh, in a, f a little few minutes, um, Marianne, uh, Ch Max Chatenoir, is going to take us in through a deep dive into uh, forensic uh, uh, genetic phenotyping uh, to kind of explain the science behind it, how it actually works. And then finally, uh, one other uh, huge uh, breakthrough has been the development of genetic genealogy. Um, this famously was used to catch the Golden State Killer. Um, they had uh, DNA left at the crime scenes from the perpetrator. Um, from that DNA, they were able, and by using uh, public uh, DNA databases, such as GEDmatch, they were able to identify um, relatives of the perpetrator, the great, great, great grandparents of the perpetrator who lived on the East Coast in the 18th century. And through that, they were able to develop a series of, of um, genealogy charts. And so the way that works is, so here's our suspect down here, right? And let's say through a public um, genealogical databases, you're able to make a link DNA-wise to some a distant relative up here at the top, let's say grandparents, you create a family tree. Who did they marry? What children did they have? This is very labor intensive work, often requiring looking at marriage records, um, uh, obituaries, things like that. It's very labor intensive, although there is software. GEDmatch, in fact, itself um, has very uh, sophisticated software to help generate these genealogical charts. Uh, and you can go down, um, and also as you go through these generations, you can begin to eliminate people as being possible suspects. Maybe they're dead, or they were dead at the time of the crime, or they lived in a different part of the country, and so forth. And you can get down to the generation that uh, is alive when the crime was committed. And again, you can begin to eliminate suspects. You can eliminate the women, for example, if the suspect is a male, right? And so eventually... You get down to the point where maybe it's one of two people. It's either this suspect guy or it's uh, this fellow over here on the right or it's this cousin over here, right? So there are limit, And then, so then, then basically you just check out these, all three of these people and see who might have been, uh, um, who might have been around at the time of the crime. Did he live in the area? things like that. Did he know the victim? And by doing that, you can eliminate everyone except for the suspect. And that's what they did with the Golden State Killer. They discovered that he was alive at the time of the crime. He lived in the area in Northern California. He was the right age and so forth. Then they surveilled him at his home um, and as he went about town and collected um, an article that he had dis discarded uh, and um, collected DNA from it and then matched that DNA to the DNA at the crime scenes. Um, and the use of these public databases uh, for this work is very controversial. We will hopefully have an opportunity to discuss this further. Um, the current, uh, there are actually guidelines for genetic uh, DNA um, uh, genealogy um, at the federal level for use by the FBI, for example, it's only to be used for violent crimes or sex crimes. Um, and, um, uh, and then also for the public databases, I think pretty much all public databases like GEDmatch and 23andMe and Ancestry.com um, do not allow uh, law enforcement to access their databases except for people who have opted in. So the users have to opt in to allow uh, law enforcement access uh, to their uh, DNA. And then also the, the data you get back from these, um, uh, that law enforcement gets back from these databases does not always necessarily identify a, a, a specific individual. 
it identifies a relative or an, an ancestor of that person and so forth. So, um, but as you can imagine, despite these safeguards, there is a potential for abuse or for other societal uh, issues. And hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss that. Um, let me see if I have another slide. Nope, that's it. So those are my slides. <laughs> Um, I had to rush through that quickly because, uh, uh, because we do have a lot more to cover. Um, so, um, at, so now I would, after that sort of uh, quick overview um, uh, of the various breakthroughs in nucleic acid sciences, um, I'd like to ask uh, Stephen to uh, uh, talk to us uh, a little bit more about how individuals are identified by DNA and what, uh, what sorts of um, uh, techniques are used. And I'm going to go ahead and take up my slide screen here uh, to get it out of the way. Okay, take it away. Right. Thank you, Matt. And I ask it. people to confirm they can hear me in local chat. Excellent. So, I wanted to step back a little bit in terms of the DNA technology so that we can all understand the common basis for how these different analyses work. So Barragon mentioned STR analysis, DNA fingerprinting. And so let's step back a little bit in time and talk and go back to this idea of DNA and it being a sequence of letters. And so Matt presented the uh, GATC aspect of it. And what I'll point you to up here at the top in my slide is the polymorphism that underlies sickle cell anemia. So there's a protein that gets made, it helps bind oxygen, and the normal sequence of it, it has a glutamate, and that's a GAG, as you can see in the slide. Well, there's a random mutation out there that leads to a GTG, and that leads to a sickle chain, which um, is bad, if you have two copies of that, you get sickle cell anemia, but is protective against malaria. Now, scientists wanted to understand the underlying basis of the mutation that leads to sickle cell anemia, primarily from a physician point of view, is that uh, we can help understand why it works, maybe help correct it. But then ultimately, and so what was actually one of the really interesting early diagnostics of sickle cell anemia and this heterozygosity was you could actually run the protein in a 2D gel and the fact that there was a different charge, the A led to the, the A mutation leading to a T, exchanging a valine for a glutamate actually changes the positive charge of the protein. So you can actually run that through a field and be different. That'd be a great diagnostic. But that's not as easy as analyzing DNA. And so the, and I don't want to get into the, a lot of the biology of this, but there are these enzymes that we discovered from bacteria called restriction enzymes. And what restriction enzymes do is recognize a particular sequence of DNA, usually very small, six, even four, sometimes eight nucleotides, and actually cuts it. So this has been, if you heard about the early days of recombinant DNA, this is what people use to recombine DNA, exchange parts, do a lot of interesting stuff there. Well, by serendipity, this A to T change was also in a cut site for an enzyme. And so what I have here on the slide is a representation that this, the sequence in normal sickle cell anemia <clears throat> would be cut, but then if it changed to a T, that cut site would disappear. And so what I'm going to do is now move my arrow, bring your attention to this idea that on a gel, and again, we're going to come back to DNA electrophoresis blobs on a gel, but in essence, if you want to know ahead of time, if someone's heterozygous for sickle cell anemia, again, they may not show a phenotype for this, you can run their DNA, and what you would see, like you have in this pedigree, is the, the parents would have two different blobs on the gel. And that's because one of their DNA strands would have the full length sequence representing um, the mutation that they have. And then the other one would have the smaller blob representing the fact that they had the, uh, that they had the original sequence, which was cut in the middle and that led to a smaller blob. And so in this case, you could even 
and this was what, what the technology was developed for, is if you had a pregnancy <clears throat> and you were concerned about whether it had sickle cell anemia, you could actually do this diagnostic. And that's what you see in these you know, theoretical children is if they had both copies of the bad allele, they would have the blob on top. If they had two copies of the good allele, they would only have the smaller blob. And if they were heterozygous, they would have both. And so again, this is an actual diagnostic ahead of time based on the DNA. Well, this concept of having what are now restriction fragment link polymorphisms. Again, the idea that you have a restriction enzyme, you have a fragment of DNA you can run on a gel, and the length is polymorphic. There are two versions of the length based on whether you do or don't have a sequence there, allows you to do this thing on the right, which is you can take a moderate amount of DNA and run it on a gel and, and compare it between different people. And so this is a, a, a sample gel where if you look at the top, you had a swab or you had a sample of DNA from a victim uh, with a crime perpetrated upon her. And then you had two different suspects. And so this idea of you look at the, you take the suspect DNA and you see if the pattern matches. Sorry, I should say there are several pieces of evidence with the victim DNA. And then if you match the pattern, you'll notice in this gel, if you look at the pattern which I'm now covering up, the suspect number one, their restriction fragment length polymorphism matches the suspect number two. And so this is kind of the basic idea of how you would do this. Now, from a legal point of view, and I want to make this distinction very clear, and Baragon kind of hinted at this, is that from a legal standpoint, you don't say this person created the DNA. What you do is you set up a mathematical probability that no one else in the world supplied that DNA at the crime scene. Does that, that make sense, everyone? Is that ultimately you're not saying you're not saying specifically this person created the DNA. You're saying nobody else, the probability of anybody else having contrib contributed that DNA is basically infinitesimal. And I think and we'll, we maybe can get into this later in the discussion because Shiloh had a question from local chat that if you have a monozygotic twin, an identical twin, or a close relative where you're trying to determine between people, the math does become more complicated and not as easy to exclude a close relative. And it's basically impossible to exclude a monozygotic twin. So I hope that kind of gives you an underlying basis of how this works. Now, the limitation of this type of RFLP analysis is that you need a pretty good quantity of DNA. You can't amplify it from small samples, and the samples don't store for very long. And so that's the main difficulty. And now what came up, and I'm actually, so while Barry and I was talking, I went and grabbed a PCR slide. I want to just go back and explain how PCR works, because it's this, you know, amazing technology, Nobel Prize in chemistry, I think, in 1993 for um, Kerry... Uh, Muller. Muller, yeah. That it's just uh, pretty amazing. So I, I grabbed this from Kimball Biology. So this is a free textbook. It actually used to be a textbook used in classes. And he basically put all the information and everything online. So I'll throw this in local chat for people. And what it's demonstrating here is that if you have some, some sample DNA, and that's what we see in the green, it's got the double helix. What you do is you denature it with heat. So the strands separate into single strands. And then you expose it to a short stretch of DNA known as a primer. And this primer is a specific sequence that matches the target sequence you're trying to amplify. And then it lies down. And then when you cycle, you add the raw material building blocks of DNA, you add a polymerase, you suddenly copy that stretch of DNA. And so, um, you know, you keep amplifying it. And then you basically keep repeating the cycle until you have lots of DNA that you can run on a gel. And so the power of PCR is that you can go from very small samples to then create a detectable threshold of sample. But there's another power of PCR too, which is that basically you can amplify at the same time any number of segments you want. It's very specific. This, it's incredibly specific to say, I'm going to amplify this stretch of DNA or this stretch of DNA or this stretch of DNA. So I hope, no, excuse me there, I hope that that explains the basic idea of PCR and how it's very powerful for how it's used specifically in forensics. So in this slide, what I'm demonstrating 
is something known as a short tandem repeat. If you look at the coloration and the letters on there, you see that the four nucleotide code of TCAG, sorry, TCAT is repeated either four, or sorry, either five, six, or seven times. And what I have highlighted on the slide are these little arrows that represent primers that sit outside of that repeat that would amplify. Now, the thing to notice is that on the left-hand side, that primer is in the same spot, but on the right-hand side, the so-called reverse primer, they are farther and farther away from the left-hand arrow every time. And so this is known as, again, a length polymorphism, but what the power of it is that people randomly have different sizes of these repeats. So it's not like the sickle cell anemia, the restriction fragment polymorphism, where the size people either do or don't have that mutation, and that's all you're trying to identify. There's a lot of variability in these short tandem repeats in the population. And so what it means is, if you take a panel of these, you can come up with a genetic profile where you're specifically tagging the length of each of these repeats at several sites. And so here's an example of this that I grabbed from uh, a website describing these types of things and how they're used in, um, forensics, and I'm trying to grab the web page really quick to make sure that everyone can kind of, I hear this. This is from a nice website on nature.com. And they're just showing a sample here where you have at the crime scene, you have a suspect, and you can say at these 13 different sites, they have these, this number of repeats or, uh, sorry, remember, and remember there are two numbers here because everyone's a diploid at the sites that are being analyzed, that they have a 15 and a 17. Sorry, the evidence sample has a 15 or a 17. Let me just pull the arrow here. Again, this first column is the evidence sample. Say, so here's the length at these two sites, at this one site for their two strands of DNA. Here's the length for their STRs at this other site. Here's this. And basically, once you know the representation of these in a population of people, potentially at this point, we have a pretty good representation of it for the world is you can say the probability of somebody contributing an evidence sample versus not. And so when you look at suspect uh, A, basically you can right away start excluding them because they have numbers that are different than the evidence sample. Sometimes they're the same, but in many cases they're not. And you can come up with a probability about, about or you basically can exclude them and they come up with a probability that this person whose numbers match the evidence sample that come with a probability that they are the only person who could have contributed that sample. So um, this is a database called CODIS. The other really big advantage of this type of analysis is that one, it's very cheap, you can do it as kits. And once everybody agrees upon a standard of doing this type of technology, and then you can also have databases that store this technology, or sorry, sorry story, store the data collected with this technology, then basically you can, take a sample and try and match it to the database. So anytime you're watching Law and & Order or an FBI show, they say, oh, we matched this to a, a criminal that then was apprehended later. And so what's really interesting about this, of course, you can connect people to a crime. And I think maybe at the end of this talk, we'll talk about privacy concerns. Because the thing too, is that the ability to collect DNA, uh, then you know, collecting DNA with the power of PCR in this database is really not the limiting factor of connecting people to crimes or other types of things. Um, I do want to talk about a similar technology because we are talking, I think, a little bit about DNA advances in general and this idea of the haplotype. And so if you string together enough, enough mutations over a stretch of DNA, they, ha they, they end up generating these things that are now termed haplotypes. So the haploid chromosome uh, has a series of mutations. And this is just an example, a theoretical representation of this, where... Um, Particular sequences change, although the majority of them uh, are the same. And then you have this representation of these in the population. These are random, so these are mutations that just randomly occur as DNA is replicated in germline cells and pop propagated in the population. And then you know people inherit these. And so what's really important about these haplotypes is now you have these strings of information, you can come up with an inheritance pattern. So a haplotype is typically transmitted from parent to offspring, 
And then once a mutation happens, it's that haplotype that's carried from parent to subsequent offspring. And so now you have this ability to do ge genetic genealogy, and that's how I wanted to introduce this as um, Baragon talked about databases, you know, these 23andMe databases and whatnot, or Ancestry.com. But essentially, scientists will use this also to look at the migration patterns of ancient humans. And so that's what's here on the bottom slide, is looking at the Y chromosome, looking at these haplotypes to actually understand human migration patterns. And what's really interesting about this is we can actually go back in the scale of thousands of years to look at the inheritance patterns of, of where people came from and where they migrated to and how they really relate to each other. And so I think this is also a really interesting, powerful technology. And there's a, a, an author, and I'm, I meant to look him up, but I'm blanking on his name. He actually wants everybody's DNA. He says everybody should put their DNA into a database that we can commonly look at all of our ancestry. And so for any of you out there who are Ancestry.com fanatics or fans, you put your DNA in and it'll do this type of haplotype analysis, mutation analysis, and say, this is who you're inherit this is to whom you're related. Maybe you're an eighth or twelfth cousin, but it gives you the sense of um, everybody on the planet being really a part of one family. And that if we could actually maybe try and put that idea forth more, then that would be very powerful. But of course, this idea of using 23andMe to identify a relative is also the type of thing that these databases can do from a criminal forensic standpoint. And that's what uh, Baragon alluded to, and we'll talk a little bit about more. Does anybody have any questions on kind of this idea of genetic inheritance patterns, STRs, and forensics and DNA? Otherwise, I'll pass it on back to Matt and let um, Marianne do the next segment. Uh, yes, this is, uh, this is Matt slash Baragon. Um, I did want to just, uh, before uh, Marianne jumps in to talk about the phenotyping, I did want to mention a little bit more about these databases. Um, uh, the CODIS database that you mentioned um, is the federal database um, uh, maintained by the FBI. Um, and um, it is uh, one of the interesting things about the CODIS database. So it is generated by uh, DNA specimens uh, obtained from um suspects or uh or uh or even uh, convicted people um who basically collected by the police the weird the frustrating thing about the codis database is how infrequently um you actually get a hit off of it from an from an unsubs uh, DNA from a crime scene, um, which is why these other tools like genetic genealogy and phenotyping and so forth um, have been so useful because the CODIS database is incredibly useless. It turns out, uh, which is something I learned recently, one reason the CODIS database is so useless is because it's heavily weighted toward African-American DNA. Most of the DNA collected by the police is from African-Americans, um, often for nonviolent crimes. Um, and so when you're when you're looking for a DNA match for a perp that's committed a violent crime or a sexual crime, CODIS is not really that helpful. Um, uh, the other thing I want to mention is that a GED match, which is um, really sort of the database of choice for law enforcement, um, uh, was uh, it is a database that was developed. Uh, uh, it uses a, 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 a family tree software that was developed by GEDmatch uh, using um, uh, uh, techniques developed by the Mormon church. Um, the Mormons uh, have a intense obsession with genealogy because I guess, according to their uh, belief system, uh, families are reunited in the afterlife. And so, um, uh, and so because of this, they have genealogical records going back for centuries, uh, very, very detailed genealogy. And they have, you know, they have they have developed their own software uh, to sort of uh, manage all of that data. Um, and so that has been exploited by GEDmatch to develop the software that they use. And GEDmatch was initially used for people to, um, uh, well, I will hey, say. Hey, well, yeah, I can. Uh, let me jump in a little yeah, bit because I've yeah, actually sure. thought about um, 
so, so let me make a general point about this type of technology when it comes to forensics is that all you're looking for is a match. And it comes down to the integrity or the power and the robustness of your database for whether you do or don't get a match. And I totally agree that there are biases in the way these are collected, particularly in America. Again, the United Kingdom has a similar one as well and be biased towards people who have, again, like getting their fingerprints taken when going into jail, have it in some sort of reason that has been taken and then available to other criminal investigations. So the, um, the power of the Mormons, as you mentioned, really does come down to the fact that they had generations of very good record keeping that actually could um, be ex used by scientists to do what's called linkage mapping for different traits. And so linkage mapping that allows you to say, oh, this person had a disease and we know what their inheritance pattern is or who they're, where they got their chromosomes from, from you know, ancestors, if we can now look at the markers that are associated with the people in that lineage of chromosomes and then say, oh, here's a marker that correlates to a disease, uh, then you can start saying, oh, that, that location on the chromosome is related to that disease. That's kind of this idea of linkage mapping. And that's, again, that comes back to the general idea, but it does come back to the idea, of course, like you're mentioning, that the record keeping is really important for making those records useful from a genetic point of view. Yeah, so th yeah, that is a huge challenge with gene genealogy is that uh, a lot of times they'll track down some distant ancestor, but but the record keeping is not good through all those generations, <laughs> right? You have to go through public documents and so forth, and it's very labor intensive. Yeah. Well, and there's another complication too, and I don't know how many people out there who've done 23andMe at this point is sometimes you get data from the genetics that does not correspond to the uh, parentage keeping. And so this idea of consanguinity, either related people or just um, having an affair that led to um, an outside of the marriage progeny, right. Right. these are things that, you know, you actually have to, scientists really have to grapple with the privacy and the usefulness of data when those types of things come up. Um, so I think it's an interesting yeah. point. I think um, I, I just want to jump in to say that, you know, the, the integrity of how these work in matching is basically biased towards what sort of data you've collected. And I think that on the one hand for forensics, and this would be one of these tensions in the public discourse would be, obviously we would love to have robust law enforcement, but the most robust law enforcement would be a dramatic invasion of privacy if we tried to collect everybody's DNA in order to make the databases better. So I think that is yeah. ultimately where we come down to a lot of these things. Now, I do believe that 23andMe, and one reason why um, uh, the JED database is, is relevant is that it was made as an open source and everybody has access to it. Right. Whereas things like 23andMe and Ancestry.com, they protect your data. They specifically only allow and redisseminate stuff that you say you can't. Law enforcement can't access their databases, at least as of the moment that I know of. So I, again, I, I want to throw that in there. Again, I've, I've taught a little bit on these types of topics before. So um, and maybe it's a good topic for discussion later. Or the fireside chat. Don't forget. We're yeah, that, I, that's what I was thinking. Uh, I want to get to Marianne real quickly. And there's a lot more we can talk about with this. And I think we are going to have to save some of it for the fireside chat. Uh, but, but while we still have time, I want to make sure that uh, Marianne has an opportunity to talk about the phenotyping because this is also super interesting. So take it away. Okay. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Oh, okay, good. All right. Well, we're going to be looking at some of the genes that contribute to the facial features um, that Matt was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, we talk about beauty being skin deep, but uh, your skin is laid over this platform of bone and cartilage and muscle. And so it's sort of bone deep. And these things are all shaped by genes. And you can see in this picture, this had the skin stripped off, how close the bone and the cartilage come to the surfaces, especially around the brow ridges and the jawline and the cheekbones and so forth. So the genetic markers that are now being used to predict facial features 
were first determined by Genome-Wide Association Studies, GWAS. And these involve getting the DNA sequences of thousands of people and then looking for specific features that, those, that some group of people might have and then looking for genetic markers that are associated with those populations and only with those populations. Uh, a lot of those markers are single nucleotide polymorphisms that Stephen talked about a little while ago. And each of those is mapped by a DNA address on a chromosome. For example, uh, this one here has a sort of catalog number of RS974448, and it's on chromosome 2, and the DNA address is at, at about base 20, 222 million, et cetera. And the two differences there are between an A at that locus um, and a G. So this is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So the first facial, the first genes that were associated with facial features were reported in 2012 by a consortium in the Netherlands. And the facial features are defined by these markers on here. You have the left and the right eye. You have um, the, the left and the right ear. You have uh, the nasal prominence, which is uh, this part down here. And then you have the, the base of the nose, which is up here. And the distances are from the eyes and the distance of the nose is, the tip of the nose is from the eyes. And then you have the wings of the nose, the ailae, which are on either side of the tip of the nose. Uh, and of course you have the mouth and you have uh, a region called the zygion, which is the, the, the widest part of the upper jaw. So, those are all uh, different kinds of reference points that you use and associate with different polymorphisms. So the first five genes that were reported were these five here, PRDM16, PAX3, TP63, et cetera. And those are all names that uh, probably mean nothing to you. Uh, and a lot of them actually were first found in uh, fruit flies and other organisms. So this is a table from that paper that identifies the single nucleotide polymorphism, the catalog number for that polymorphism, um, the name of the gene that it is in, the chromosome that it's on, uh, the base pair address on the chromosome, and then the effective uh, allele, that is the, the allele that makes the most difference. In, uh, in, that, in that trait. And then the traits are over here on the right. And that, in, that includes um, how, far, how far apart the ailey, the, the nasal wings, are from the tip of the nose. Um, PAX3 determines the distance between the right and the left eye to the base of the nose. So these are all little distances that are affected by these polymorphisms. So what most of these facial genes do is to encode transcription factors. And these are genes that regulate the activity of other genes, and none of them only work on faces. They work all over the body. They're, they're growth regulators in various body regions. So these are kind of the movers and the shapers of the human body. And they include things like sonic hedgehog, which regulates um, the anterior, posterior, embryonic axis, the fibroblast growth factors and the bone morphogenetic proteins, which regulate the growth of bones and cartilage, uh, some homeobox genes that determine where particular structures are located, uh, and so forth. So for example, this PAX3 gene was first associated with nervous system development in fruit flies. So PAX3 is a transcription factor, um, and its name comes from a paired or a, a, a chunk of DNA that is found uh, in, that, in that region, in that gene. 
So here are just a few of the genes that are associated with different facial features. PAX3 with the distance from the eye to the nose, uh, PRDM16 with the length of the nose, SOX9 with the shape of the nose tip and the width of the nasal ailey. And you can see that some of these, like PRDM16, are associated with more than one feature, like PDR PRDM16 is associated both with the length of the nose and also with, um, oh, I put that on there twice, never mind. Okay, um, so they all have, they all have weird names. So this next slide shows how those polymorphisms are used to uh, generate the algorithms that produce a face from the DNA sample. So this is just one particular polymorphism, uh, 97444H in PAX3. And this first little mask up here shows where that gene is uh, active in the face. And then these next two show the difference in activity between those two different, uh, different versions of that gene. And this wireframe down here shows where those effects are located. So the, the red wireframe is uh, what you get with the A allele, and the green wireframe is what you get with the G allele. So these individual, and bunches of these are used in generating the algorithms that produce a, a, a sort of human mask. And this slide just lists a bunch of other genes that uh, are associated with different parts, uh, parts of the face. And you can see there are lots of genes at each of these locations. So there are about 200 genes now that have been identified that are associated with controlling facial features. Uh, this is from a recent report in 2020. Um, and what you have here is different quadrants of the face. So you've got in the middle here, you've got um, the upper and lower uh, nasal region. And then you have the upper uh, region associated with the eyes and this region associated with, uh, with the jaw and the chin. And then in the middle part of the face, there are several others. So each of these are color coded around the edges here. Um, and there are a bunch of genes associated with each of these facial regions. And uh, these little boxes here just show the variation that you see in the, uh, in the United States on the outside of the ring and in the UK on the inside of the ring. And then over on the right side, it just shows where those genes are located on the different chromosomes. So this shows the chromosomal locations of those differences. And those peaks that you see sticking out show what the, what the, variant, the variation you see at those loci, those, at those uh, different regions. So the next thing I do want to do is just tell you this little story about how, how good this ability to identify individuals is. And this is from 1915. So it's probably a little bit better now. So in 1915, there were two employees of the New York Times and they had their DNA sequences and they sent their sequences off to Mark Schreiber at Penn State who had developed the software for producing images from this genetic polymorphism information. And the images were produced for both individuals one female, one male, and given to their colleagues uh, and asked, and the, and the colleagues were asked if they could identify the individuals that these uh, faces belong to, and 50 of their colleagues responded. So this was the guy who had donated the, uh, the DNA for the male face, and none of his colleagues were able to identify him correctly. 
On the other hand, uh, the colleagues of the female, about a third of them were able to correctly identify her from, uh, from the faces that have been produced from the genes. This might be a male-female difference because one of the things I've noticed is that it's a lot easier for me to uh, remember which of my students is who, which of my female students is which, when I first get a new class than it is for me to learn the males. So I don't know if we just pay more attention to female faces or if female faces are, are more highly differentiated or what it is. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, oh, that's not 1915, uh, that's 2015. That's 2015, that's a mistake. Yeah, I was just about to break in to ask you about that. So there's some, yeah, okay, very good. But thank you for noticing that. Okay, so uh, the next few slides, I think I'm just not going to show you because they're similar to what, um, what Matt showed you a little bit earlier. Um, and that's all I have to say. I'll go ahead and run through these others quickly just so you can see what they look like. You know, something I'll just mention while people are running through that is people can now use telomere length to get a sense of somebody's age. So I wonder if that's something that they try and incorporate. From well, a that's in, yeah, that's interesting. I, uh, well, that's uh, a good idea. Um, uh, yeah, that would, I, would, I would think that would make the age progression that much more uh, advanced uh, or, or precise. And there's some references if you want to read more about this. And I think that it's, uh, uh, it is worth noting with regard to the DNA phenotyping that, um, uh, uh, you, know, you know, previously uh, to generate an image of a perp, you know, you had, to, you, had, you had to take a witness to sit down with a forensic artist to generate a composite image of, of who the witness saw. Um, and there's actually, that's called, those are called composites now because they're actually generated with facial feature software that the artists, you know, you basically show them a, a bunch of noses and the witness picks out the nose and then you show them a bunch of eyes and the witness picks out the eyes and you show them a bunch of shape faces and the witness picks out a shape face and so you create a composite by doing that. Um, which is very similar to what happens with the DNA phenotyping, right? You sort of, you look at uh, what is, what are the, what is the genes for the nose tell you? What is the gene for the eyes tell you? And so forth. So they are both composites, but the eyewitness uh, composite images are, I think, no more reliable or accurate than those generated through DNA. Well, I think that's actually been a really interesting topic over the past uh, 15, 20 years is exactly how unreliable eyewitness testimony can be. Yes. Uh, and even fingerprints are now becoming, again, fingerprints were actually never established as a scientifically valid way of identifying people. It's something that can work. What was also interesting is the amount, like, I believe fingerprinting does work, but there's also this level of validating the fingerprinter. And so exactly how, in the numerics, they can put behind excluding people or, you know, identifying someone as a fingerprint lever at, in terms of evidence is something that's also now being highly questioned, at least relative to once you have DNA technology. Right. Uh, uh, DNA is, uh, fingerprints are certainly being challenged more by defense attorneys uh, than they have in the past. Although I have come across a few uh, true case uh, crime stories uh, where the DNA, in fact, corroborated the fingerprint evidence, too. So fingerprints are still pretty good, I think, as a rule. So, well, Yeah, and I think just the databases for how many people are in fingerprint databases is very different, probably still bigger than what you'd have in terms of criminally or forensically accessible DNA databases. Yes, and I also think that fingerprint comparison software uh, is great, is much better now than it used to be. Fingerprints are more reliable because they're analyzed by algorithms rather than by the human eye. 
Um, and yes. I think that's improved fingerprints uh, as well also. Um, but I think, again, I, I don't know how much the audience recognizes your attempt to look like Robert Stack or maybe uh, Carl Malden from the Unsolved Mysteries, but everyone knows <laughs> from having watched TV the power of being able to put out a facial thing for people. So I, like America's Most Wanted to say, can you identify this person? And what that does is it casts a, a net, right? It allows you to cast a net that if you use these other things that can specifically f say this person is essentially the criminal or no one else could have been, that's where the power of this DNA forensics the, of the facial features is, is so amazing. Right, right. I did stand up here because I did want everyone to uh, admire my detective outfit. <laughs> I, I loved it. <laughs> Uh, well, um, there is a lot more we could discuss here, uh, but we are just a little past the hour. So I think it might be best to maybe um, uh, uh, go ahead and stop here. And um, I'm, I think we should continue this with our fireside chat later this week. I think we can have a lot more fun uh, getting into um, a lot more of the issues uh, that, the, uh, that this, this power um, uh, bestows upon us. Uh, my real goal here today is I really wanted uh, our students to just come away with an appreciation of how really how powerful this technology is. And this has really just come about within the last 10 to 20 years or so um, that our understanding of uh, of genetic material, the, the tools we've developed to exploit it um, for all sorts of purposes. Um, I just feel like it's underappreciated. Um, people love the space program and people love the internet, but you know, DNA technology is keeping pace. It is going to be revolutionary in our lives uh, and in our grandchildren's lives. And I just wanted to, just wanted to ram that point home before we close out. We can talk about some of the ethical issues too. Absolutely, I think that that will be uh, that's something we really need to dive into in the fireside chat. So I hope you all will join us. I think it's scheduled for Wednesday. Is that right? Uh, yes, I think so. Wednesday evening. Let's take a look. I think Chantal, fireside chat, February third, four p.m. Uh, SLT. So. Be there, be square. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to thank my speakers today, uh, Stephen and Marianne, and thank you all for uh, attending and for your um, and for your comments. And with that, I'll gavel us to a close. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Matt. Matt. Thanks for hosting.